Hello, this is Paul Lucas for Jumpstart Nature Photography. In today's video lesson, we're going to cover something I call the first field session. Uh, I know you're anxious to get out and start shooting, so these are going to be, this presentation is going to cover a few ideas about camera setup, a little, so we're getting a little bit at the craft of using our camera, and some ideas on composition. This is going to be a very comprehensive, fast-moving, quick presentation. Uh, it'll be a little bit longer than other presentations I plan to give, but it's to get you out and start shooting right away. And then we'll follow up, I will follow up with additional presentations that will cover some of the things we discussed uh, more in depth, such as composition and, and the craft of shooting, using your camera and, and taking photographs. I'm going to deliver these lectures like I do in my classroom. Uh, the only difference is I'm not going to get have eye contact or get direct feedback from you. So please do not hesitate, you know, please don't hesitate to email me. You can see the email address, paul at jumpstartnaturephotography.com. Please email me with questions. Uh, what I might do is put uh, together like a video session and answer the questions uh, that way in groups weekly or however often I get information. So just a couple of things again, if you haven't seen the first video, you can see some of my work at paullucasphotography.com. As it says, I'm happy to come and speak to your local library or photo photography club or what, what other, whatever other organization is, uh, generally for no charge. If the distance is really far, I might need, I might ask for some compensation for mileage. I'm available for hire, of course, for classes and workshops. I'm a photography instructor in the uh, Chicago area. If you'd like a PDF copy of this, please email me. I'm happy to share it with you. It, and any questions, again, please send those to me. I'd also like to be, I, I would hope that folks will send me their photographs for critique sessions. This is the same thing I do in my classroom, where it's a positive, constructive photo critique of your work to help you look, look at your photos, how you can improve them, how you can improve your composition skills, things to consider. Um, so let's say you send me four photographs. They can be right out of your camera or edited with something. I'll critique them via a YouTube session so that everybody can share and understand and learn and grow from that experience. Uh, I do editing in Lightroom, so I'll show you some of my ideas. I do not do extent, what I consider extensive editing, but I'll show you um, what I do. I'll show you the before and after the photos. I'm not going to allow public comments on YouTube because I, I don't want any trolls. That's not the purpose of this. And then when we're finished, I'll send you a copy of your photos uh, that I've with my edits. If you're interested in participating, please drop me a note at Paul Lucas, at Paul, sorry, Paul at jumpstartnaturephotography.com. So now we'll get into the couple topics in, in first field session, camera setup and composition. The one thing I'll say about camera setup is that you should find your owner's manual. Your owner's manual, you'll need to look at that occasionally. I know it's not always the a hap, uh, most friendly document to use, but it will help you understand your camera and how to make these settings and adjustments. And these settings and adjustments we're going to discuss are available virtually on any kind of camera system, whether it's a traditional digital single lens reflex, a film camera, a, a, a sophisticated point and shoot, all, any of those mirrorless cameras. The only cameras these are not maybe available on are the least expensive point and shoots. And so those those will be a bit more of a challenge, but send me questions and we'll see what we can uh, do to use those cameras as well. So please get your owner's manual out and have it handy. So one thing, um, kind of an unusual thing maybe to start with is, is setting up your diopter. So when you look through your, your lens finder, even on an electronic viewfinder or through a traditional viewfinder, uh, you'll need to adjust that for your eyes. If you're wearing glasses, you know, contacts, if you, you don't need a prescription. Anyway, you'll need to adjust that to make sure that your image coming through the viewfinder is as sharp as possible. Um, I would recommend, as it says, put it on a table, something stable, a tripod, focus on a flat object with some texture. It could be wallpaper, it could be the garage door, as I said. And then you move the diopter. There's a little adjustment. This is where you have to look at your owner's manual. But there's a little, typically a, a little screw like that has a plus minus symbol uh, near your lens, near your viewfinder, I'm sorry, near your viewfinder that you adjust back and forth until you can see um, clear on that. So you need to focus on an object and then adjust that. The next thing I recommend is if your viewfinder supports grid lines, turn them on. Uh, again, you'll have to look in your manual, 
Uh, the grid lines will help you with making sure things are level. Uh, they'll also, sometimes they have, um, they use the tool of thirds, as I like to call it, not the rule of thirds, markings to help you think about how you're composing your photographs. So I always recommend turning those on uh, to help with some guidance and level and setting levels and thinking about how you want to arrange your elements in the composition. If you do have a, a level in your viewfinder on the back of your camera, I recommend turning that on because uh, you don't want your photographs to be tipped sideways in the horizon. You don't want a picture of, of water and it looks like it's draining out of one side. If you don't have a viewfinder in your or a level in your viewfinder or your camera, then I would recommend purchasing a level that sits in the camera hot shoot. If you have a question about that, um, you know what that is or need a link to uh, some ideas, please send me an email. Again, uh, it's great if it's in your viewfinder, that's the ideal place to have it because then you can create your composition, make sure your, your camera is level with the horizon, and you're done. If you're using a viewfinder on top, it's a little harder to adjust, but uh, a little more work, but not impossible. File format, so you have a, usually um, a, several options, but I would recommend turning on RAW. Uh, RAW captures all the native data coming into your camera's sensor. Uh, it provides exactly what the sensor is seeing before it's processed. A JPEG file, while it's smaller in size, is being processed in your camera. It's as if you've run Lightroom with some presets. You've decided how you want the color balance to look, the sharpening, etc. The JPEG does that for you. You have a small computer in your camera. And when you have JPEG on, it's taking that the raw data coming in and adjusting it to the predefined settings, usually from the manufacturer, to what it should look like. With the raw file, we can do all kinds of great things with the photograph after we've completed it. After, I, Like I said, when you capture a photograph and you first look at it, whether it's in raw or JPEG, in Lightroom or in Photoshop or another editing software, it often looks very flat. And there's a lot of things we can do to give it depth and dimensionality. And that's an important thing to do. If you don't feel comfortable uh, shooting in RAW only, or if you don't plan to uh, jump right into Lightroom initially, then record them in both. Because you, if you get a great composition in, in JPEG only, you're going to have less ability to um, do post-editing and work on that as well. And that's the second step as in composition. The first step is the composition in the field. You should try to get that as best as you can possible with the most data, but the post-processing is equally an important part. Just like Ansel Adams, he would take a photograph out in the field and then he would equally work on it in, in, the, in his dark room. If I remember correct, um, Ansel, Ansel, sorry, Ansel would say, the, the negative is the conductor score, to use an anal music analogy, and the photo is the performance. The print is the performance. And when Ansel would say I'm visualizing the photo, he's really talking about his, the visualization, certainly the composition, but what he would be thinking about to do in the darkroom to make that photograph uh, look the way he had envisioned it in his mind. Uh, so again, if you can capture both, that's great. You can also adjust your JPEG settings. If you want to change color balance or contrast, saturation, sharpness, a wide variety of things you can do that in JPEG, um, and I would suggest maybe looking in your manual to do that. Otherwise, uh, you can turn on and record, typically for most cameras, both RAW and JPEG. I would set my metering to what is called, everybody's a little different, but the idea of this metering is it takes data from the whole frame and looks at that data, typically against a database, to determine the correct exposure. Uh, so the correct exposure is a combination, as we'll talk about um, a little bit here, and in more depth in future presentations, the exposure triangle, right? That's a combination of shutter speed, your, your aperture setting, and your ISO setting. Uh, so I would recommend first, when you're going out in the field, set it uh, for Nikon. It's called Matrix, Canon Evaluative Metering, Multi, and Sony. If you have a question, if you're using another uh, brand of camera, you're not sure, Samsung, um, uh, let me know, and I'll, I'm glad to look online to find the manual. I, uh, and I will mention the, the manual. You can often get them as a PDF, so I would recommend downloading it, putting it on your phone, having it on your computer. That way you have it conveniently with you when you're out in the field and you have questions. So matrix metering will work well for, for 
95 plus percent of our, our fo photography of nature and landscape compositions. We'll occasionally run into things where it, it's, it's more challenging, and we'll talk about some of those in upcoming uh, presentations. But typically what we're doing in landscape, we can turn on matrix metering, meter the scene, uh, the camera will help us determine the proper exposure, and then take our photograph. I would turn off um, I, the auto ISO. So often if you're in program or in auto mode, that you point at something and the camera's going to adjust all three things, right? Shutter speed, aperture, and your ISO. So we want to set our ISO to the lowest number to get the highest quality photo. And then we'll talk about the other settings briefly as to what we'll do in nature and landscape photography. And the great thing about nature and landscape photography is that we can take our time. There is no rush, uh, not too much of a rush. Of course, if we're trying to get a sunset, we only have a few minutes to capture the best image. But we're in not as big a rush as if we're trying to capture a port in a portrait where we have humans posing or if we're trying to capture some sort of action scene, a sporting event, or uh, such as running or football or racing or whatever it might be. But anyway, we'll set our ISO to the lowest number for most cameras. That's 100 or 200. And we'll want to set that in the manual in, a, in, a, in the mode that turns off the auto. Uh, so we're going to set our cameras. We'll talk about this in momentarily in, auto, in aperture mode. But we want to make sure, even in aperture mode, we want to make sure our ISO is set that we're changing it, not the camera automatically adjusting it. So as I mentioned, we're going to use aperture priority. And in nature and landscape photography, for most images, the most important aspect is the depth of field and the, or depth of focus. And that is how much of the scene is from the closest subject to the farthest away subject is in focus, is an acceptable focus. Uh, so we'll use what's called aperture priority mode. Uh, it's, it's often A or AV in, on a Canon A and a Nikon. Uh, I don't have a Sony. I think Sony's also A. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll determine our depth of field by changing the aperture opening, and we'll let the camera choose the shutter speed. The shutter speed will be based on our ISO setting, which we're starting at 100, remember, and our aperture setting. Uh, we'll use the ISO to adjust or, or the exposure compensation. We'll talk about that exposure compensation in a future presentation. For now, we'll just use ISO to adjust our shutter speed. And we'll talk about why we might need to do that in, in a couple slides here. For most landscape photography, uh, the sweet spot, uh, and, and there's a bigger discussion here about absolute sharp, Im, image sharpness and, and sharpness of, Im, of, of the detail coming through your lens. But for landscape and nature photography, we're going to choose f11 or f16 to start out with. And that will give us a very good depth of field for most photographs. And this is going to change, and we'll talk about this, uh, w with, depending on the, the, the length of our lens. Meaning, are we using a, a normal lens, 50 millimeters? Are we using wide angle, 24? Are we using a telephoto, 100 or 200? The, the depth of field will vary, and we'll talk about that coming up. So these are just some general, get you out in the field, start shooting today kind of rules. So start with f11 or f16. And once you've taken, uh, you've got your composition and you've shot it at f11 or f16, run through all of the, your f stops. Now, I would recommend cameras now can do one third of f stops. It's easier for me and I think everyone else to think in full f stops. And we'll talk about that in a future presentation about the exposure triangle and what it means when you change that. But typically, whole ones you'll see they run from might be 2.0 or, or 2.0. That's a very wide aperture setting to 22. So 2.0, 2.8, 4, f5, 6, 8, 11, 16, 22. Those are what we call full stops. On some lenses, uh, you may have a variable uh, aperture setting, which is your widest opening. It might be 3.5 to 4.0, 3.5 to 5.6. Whatever your focal length range is and whatever is the widest one, start there and then go whole stop. So if you start at 3.5, maybe that's the, the widest aperture, the biggest opening of your lens, then go 3.5, shoot 4.0, 5.6, 8, 11, 16, and 22, while focusing on the same subject. Don't move your camera. Don't change your subject. Uh, composition or the focal point. You may have to adjust if you're not shooting on a tripod or it's a very windy day, you may have to adjust the ISO for each shot, the, the, the sensor sensitivity or the film subita as it was called in the old days, the ISO, to 
uh, make sure we get a good shutter speed. So aperture priority, um, we'll use ISO to change our shutter speed and we'll start with f11 or f16. But don't be afraid to try other settings on your camera. You're not going to hurt anything and there's no charge for taking lots of photographs. It just fills up your, your memory card. So we'll talk a little bit about autofocus. One thing I want to mention is if you're shooting on a tripod, which I highly recommend, uh, it's a separate discussion in itself using what kind of tripod, all that. But if you're shooting on a tripod, turn off any visual, any kind of stabilization capability in your lens. So that might be image stabilization in Canon, vibration reduction in Nikon, uh, optical, uh, in, in Sony it's OSS. I cannot remember what that acronym stands for, but turn that off. And then we want to set, if possible, if you can find this in your manual, the ability to choose a single autofocus point. Again, out of the box, your camera may look at the image, the scene you're trying to take, and try to find a subject closest to the camera to focus on. We don't want that. We want to be able to control what our, our focus subject is. And then the depth of field will determine how much focus in front of that subject and behind that subject we have. So look in your manual. Often you have little dots within your viewfinder that show different focal points. We'll want to use uh, a single focal point when we're focusing our camera. So for nature and landscape scenes, where do we focus? So I'm going to give a very generalized rule. This will change, and we'll talk about this when we use different focal lengths. So I don't want any um, nasty grams from, from the experts out there saying that this is you know incorrect for some focal lengths. I understand that. But as a general rule, this will work for mo most focal length, meaning, again, a focal length might be 50 millimeter for a normal lens, a normal uh, focal length. 24 is a, an example of a wider 100 or 200 for our telephoto. So if all our elements are on the same plane, uh, that means there's not a lot of things behind them or in front of them, pick the key object to focus on. Uh, if you're photographing close-ups of flowers, so there we might use a telephoto lens or a specialized telephoto lens called a macro lens, where do you want the focus attention to be? What part of the, the, the flower? Because um, when you're focusing... When you're shooting something close up, you have a very narrow depth of field, and we'll, we'll talk about that. For most larger scenes, uh, generally when you're using focal lengths between wide and, and, and normal to the low end of telephoto, as a general rule, um, you, can use, you can pick an object that's about a third of the way up from the bottom of your viewfinder frame to focus on. Um, or if there's a key object in the picture that you want as a focus point, pick that. So here's some examples. Here's a, just a, a scene in the fall of the woods. So in this example, about a third, if you were viewing this, about a third of the way up in your frame is where that red box is. So pick something in there that you can focus on. Maybe you can actually focus on that tree stump on the left um, and use that as the focal point. Again, if you use an F16, um, then you should have good focus from in front of the object, the tree, to, to the background. Uh, here's a scene I converted from color to black and white. Again, find something in the middle of, of about a third of the way into the frame. Um, let me back up a section, second. So if you have the, your viewfinder and you're looking through it, you have different focal points. You can move those little focal points around. The, the best thing to do is if there's a focal point, as you frame this picture, if there's a focus point in your viewfinder, that is closest to that tree, move it over there. And then slightly, if you, it may not exactly land on that focus point in your viewfinder, but slightly move your camera, focus on the tree, keep your focus locked, and then recompose your picture and take it. We don't want to have the focus point, say, in the upper right-hand corner, and you move your camera all the way in the viewfinder to focus on that tree stump and then move it back. That's too much. It's not going to be correctly focused. Um, Send me questions because I know that's probably a slightly confusing thing and I'll have to think of a future way to illustrate that in a future uh, video. Here again, you could probably actually focus on the pavement, um, or that's asphalt, I believe, uh, right in front. So just a subject, you could stay in the middle but pick something uh, that's in, the, in your viewfinder. If there's a focus point near that one-third point, then, then move it there. Uh, again, here's a, a morning shot. 
Uh, you could focus on those concrete barriers um, in the front there, one of those as a focal point. Uh, here is a faraway object, um, a, a broken down pier. Um, I would suggest uh, the focusing on the left hand side of the pier, that's the part closest to you, but that's about of a third of the part of the way into the frame. So uh, that would be a key place. Oops, sorry. Just like in my classroom, I made a mistake. Uh, here, uh, here's an example where I didn't use F16, right? I used uh, a, a wider aperture opening. So probably uh, on my lens, I believe uh, this is set at 2.8. Uh, and I wanted that rock to be in focus. So that was my main subject. I wanted everything else to be soft in the background, but I wanted that stone in the front. So I focused on the front of the stone with F2.8. This is a great example of a subject and composition where you could focus on the stone with your widest aperture setting, 2, 2, 8, 3, 5, 4, whatever it might be, 5, 6, depending on your focal length, and then go through your aperture settings and hold f-stops to see how the background becomes more in focus, how the depth of field, the depth of focus, uh, changes with the aperture settings. So maybe you start at f3.5 here, then you take another shot at f4, f5.6, f8, f11, f16. Uh, this shot I did uh, looking down on the ground with a telephoto lens and I focused the subject, the main subject was, uh, and this is a very flat non-dimensional photograph. Everything is pretty much on the same plane. Uh, I focused on uh, the leaf and I set the f-stop uh, as high as possible to get uh, the depth of focus. So in a macro situation, I didn't use a macro lens at this time, I didn't have one, but in a macro situation, you have to be very careful because you have a very narrow depth of field. Uh, you you want to make sure, or depth of focus, you want to make sure everything is in focus. So uh, you would use the highest f-stop, f22 or 32 sometimes in a macro, and then look at your viewfinder to make sure everything is in focus. You might have to make a manual adjustment or pick a different object to focus on. But these things are pretty close together in a, in a pretty flat plane. I'll also mention, while I, I recommend and typically try to shoot so I fill the full frame, uh, it was a combination of uh, how far away I had to be because I was using a telephoto lens. So I was probably standing about four feet, looking straight down on a tripod, four feet above it. So I couldn't move the camera up or down anymore and see it still. Um, so I had to crop this to get the exact composition. Cropping is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I would recommend though, trying to use all of the frame when you shoot a photo. Don't always automatically think I'm taking the photo and I'm going to crop it later. Try to use, I like to, uh, as I've learned, shoot with intent, shoot with purpose, try to use the full frame because you're getting all the data captured as much as possible. But that doesn't mean that you're gonna, every composition situation you're going to be able to do that. So feel free to take a photograph that has the core of your composition but realize you may have to crop it later. Also if you're shooting uh, macro photography and you're concerned about depth of field, uh, a, a topic more advanced for a later discussion is the ability to do uh, focus on multiple layers. So you can actually take several shots focused at different points. Uh, physically the lens is focusing you know, from a near to a farther away, maybe three or four or five shots, whatever it might take to get a de greater depth of field. And then you can combine those in Photoshop or other software focus stacking software uh, to get a maximum depth of field. The, the, the photo software is very smart and sophisticated in understanding w what images, how to blend them together to get you the greatest depth of field. You could use that for every photo you do, but that would be, for me, a lot of extra work that I don't, I don't personally think is necessary for most of my photographs that I'm trying to accomplish. For macro photography, probably something you might want to consider for most general landscape and nature photography, um, I, you can try it out and determine when focus stacking makes sense. Again, that's kind of an, an advanced uh, topic and discussion that we'll touch on in a, in a future uh, presentation. Uh, and then finally, again, this was shot again without a macro lens uh, and some other um, lectures we'll talk about or, or class sessions we'll talk about macro lenses a little bit. Uh, this was shot with a uh, 200 millimeter 
our 70 to 200 uh, telephoto lens. I, I don't remember the setting, sorry. Uh, but again, uh, I was I focused on um, the middle of the flower. Uh, I used experimented a little bit. I think this was an f/5.6 or an f/8 to blur out the background. But with a telephoto or a macro lens, you can often uh, accomplish that. But again, I chose that center point as my focused um, point as as the to to get focus the subject as I wanted it. So that's focusing a lot of stuff. Just some ideas to get started. Right, this is not the end all be all of everything uh, in photography you'll need to know or want to do or experiment with. This is just some ideas to get you out right away uh, and shooting. And we'll go back and, and talk about all these things in more depth. So making uh, the composition, right? Setting up your composition, focus your shot, choose your aperture setting, right? So what, what about this shutter speed thing? So we're gonna, we've got our composition, we've got our focus point, and we've choose our aperture setting. Now we look at the camera and we see the shutter speed is 1 15th of a second. Is that good or is that bad? If it's handheld, likely it's bad because you're going to, just the natural movement of your body, even when you're standing still, is not going to produce the sharpest image. Uh, the general rule for handheld shots, we'll start there, is 1 divided by the focal length. If you're shooting a telephoto lens that is a 200 millimeter, even if it's a zoom telephoto from 70 to 200, but the maximum telephoto focal length is 200, you'd want to shoot at 1 over 200 of a second for a handheld shot with that camera, at, at a minimum for most people. Um, and there is not a, again, I don't think in fractions of, of, um, of shutter speeds, I think in whole stops, 1 one hundred twenty-fifth of a second is a is one of the traditional whole stops in shutter speeds. So I would, um, or I would shoot that camera uh, at, uh, I would with a two hundred millimeter lens. I would shoot at um, one two hundred fiftieth of a second. I had to think there a second. Uh, so that would be the the setting. I would not use. You, you could use one over two hundred, but I like to think in whole stops. If you're on a tripod, which I highly recommend, and again, tripods range in quality and stability, but uh, for tripods, you could probably get away with a 1 30th of a second for almost any lens. If you're shooting on a, on a tripod, I would also recommend um, either using a shutter release or a remote shutter release or the timer so you're not touching the camera, right? Once you set the focus and your composition, you click that to get the sharpest shots. To get the sharpest shots, we need good shutter speed, and a stable platform not touching the camera, not us touching the camera, right? So using a timer or some sort of shutter release. Anyway, if the shutter speed is too slow, so 1 15th of a second, if it's not a breezy day and you're on a tripod and you have a remote shutter release, you might be able to do that. But think about 1 30th of a second as kind of the standard you want to aim for on a tripod. Uh, for most handheld shots, unless it's a 200 millimeter telephoto lens or zoom lens and one 125th for handheld shots. If your shutter speed is too slow, so I'm doing this on a tripod and it comes up at one fifth of a second, I can use my ISO and I'll adjust that in whole stops uh, to make my camera sensor more sensitive, <clears throat> excuse me, and that will increase my shutter speed. So I've got my camera sensor set at ISO 100 and the whole stops for ISO, they double. It's 100, 200, 400, 800, 1200, et cetera. So if I'm at 1 tenth of a second and ISO 100 and I go to one, and I go to 200 ISO, I've doubled my shutter speed from 1 tenth of a second to 1 20th of a second. Again, uh, you know, I like, I like to think in whole stops. Uh, I would probably go one more to 400th. 400 ISO, which would give me 1 80th of a second to make sure I'm not getting uh, any, a very sharp image and, and no blur in that when shooting on a tripod. I always shoot on a tripod. So that, that is how we would adjust the shutter speed if it's too low. It'll depend on the scene. It'll depend on the time of the day. Uh, but we'll move our shutter speed uh, accordingly. Our ISO will increase our ISO to get the shutter speed we want. So remember 100, 200, 400. Again, you can set your ISO to do uh, one half stops or one third stops. You can just 
don't worry about remembering 100 or 200 or 400. Just adjust, you know, learn how to adjust your ISO up, set it off, turn it off of auto. Remember, we want it at 100 or 200, whatever the lowest normal setting is for the for our camera. And then adjust it until you get to 1 30th of a second or more if it's on a, on a tripod or 1 1 25th in a handheld shot unless you're using a really long telephoto lens. And then I would recommend starting at 1 200th of a second. And then when you're done taking that shot, if you're moving on to a different composition, remember to change your ISO back to 100. All right, so just to set up summary, let's turn our, our images to capture RAW and JPEG. Let's set our camera to ap aperture priority and start with F11 or F16. Again, feel, feel free to try different f-stop settings once you've got your composition and focal point. Set your camera to its lowest fixed ISO, ISO which might be 100 or 200. Uh, set your metering mode to matrix, evaluative, or multi, depending on your camera. If you're on a tripod, uh, as I mentioned, 1 30th of a second is a good one. Unless it's an extremely windy day and you're out shooting, then you might want to have a faster shutter speed. If it's handheld for uh, lenses under 100 millimeters, so 24, 50, 100, 1, 1 125th of a second handheld is great. If it's a telephoto that goes all the way to 200, you want 1 200th or 1 250th, 250th of a second as a minimum. And again, as I, as I mentioned here, it says the ISO number, as we increase it, our sensor is more sensitive to the light and your shutter speed will increase. I think in whole stops, again, don't worry about that. Look at your shutter speed and adjust your ISO up. So it might be that you end up adjusting it to 320 ISO to get to 1 30th of a second. Also set your camera up to choose your focus point. All uh, DSLRs, sophisticated points and shoots, mirrorless cameras have the ability to move your focus point around. You look in your viewfinder and you'll see these little red dots. Typically they're red, and those are focus point targets that you can move. Some cameras have 50, some have nine, and other cameras have somewhere in between. So I would always choose the one nearest to the object you're focusing on, and that should be about one third of the way up in your viewfinder. You saw some examples uh, before. So that's just a little quick summary uh, to remind you of the things we want to set up. So we're going to switch gears real quickly and talk about uh, a quick composition overview. Composition is a huge subject in itself. I, you could have a whole class on composition. And often in uh, instructors that I've worked with and instructors I've taken classes from, we might spend uh, two or three class sessions on composition. So we'll touch upon it a little more in some of our Jumpstart uh, sessions coming up but this is a very large topic. Uh, so off we go. So what's composition? Composition is the organization of elements within our image, how we want things to look, to capture that vision or creation, that mood or that feeling that we're looking to capture within our image. So let's talk about the rules of composition. Rule one, there are no rules. Rule two, see rule one. So the, the, the point is that there are composition tools. There are no rules in composition. Uh, there are things to help us express our creativity and express our art, express a feeling, a thought, or a mood. And these are all tools of composition. We shouldn't use them all the time. We, we might use different ones. But we'll talk about uh, a common one here coming up to get you started. Some of the composition tools you might use are things called the tool of thirds. And we'll talk about what that is in a little more in depth. Other things, you look at leading lines, so a diagonal line or curves. Curves are very powerful. C's or S's, an S curve. Z curves are often very hard to find in nature, but you may have seen a photograph of like a mount, Rocky Mountains, for example, in the fog, and it actually gives, there's a, you can sometimes see a Z line. Uh, things that have re repeating past patterns, uh, things that are contrast, the contrast and texture, contrast from light to darkness, texture and the different kinds of texture. Maybe you're taking a shot of a lake or, or an ocean and you have one kind of texture with the sand, a different kind of texture with the water, and a third texture with the sky if there's clouds in it. And that helps to give you the three-dimensionality within that. There might be different textures. Uh, so the contrast can be color contrast, it could be texture contrast, it could be lighting contrast. Uh, color is an important thing, so we might want to you know look for uh, in our composition, we might want to have complementary colors, things like green and red, um, 
different kinds of moods, orange and blue, right? Uh, lighting is very important. The lighting uh, has to do with, you know, time of day and the direction and angle of the light. The angle and perspective that we take, are we standing up? Are we down low? Are, are we shooting from one side or the other? Uh, and then looking for things that are point counterpoints. So example, you might be taking a photograph of a group of pines and they're all growing up very straight, but there's one curved pine, one pine that kind of curves uh, off uh, in, in amidst that forest of straight pines. For some reason, it did not grow up straight. So you might anchor that in a corner of your composition and that would be a point counterpoint. But remember, there are no rules. These are all tools that can help your composition. And as you look at photographs, look at photographs, look at other people's photographs, look at the masters, and steal from them. The best people steal. Uh, you know, a, a good artist borrows, a great artist steals. Don't feel afraid to look at a, a composition and then think, oh, I know a, a place in a park or a forest preserve um, or a botanic garden that's similar to that shot. Go and try and recreate that shot. It's an excellent learning tool. So just remember, in framing your picture and comp composing it, there's no rush. This is a great thing about landscape and nature photography. And all these skills you learn, you'll be able to take them and transfer them if you want to do portrait photography or street photography, documentary, news, whatever it might be. All these skills will be great. It's the same skills. It's just here we have, we can learn at a little more leisurely pace. It's, it, we don't have the pressure and stress to produce an image quickly. But there's no rush. Walk around. Find a subject that interests you. When you see that subject, look through the camera viewfinder. Do I need to move, you know, that'll give you the framing sense, right? Do I need to move closer, move forward? Do I move back, move left or right, up or down vertically to change my perspective, change my angle? Try if you've got a, a, a zoom lens of some sort, try zooming in or zooming out, stepping back and zooming in, see what happens. Move around until you think you found the, uh, your first really good shot. And think about where the light is coming from in this shot. We, you know, we have front light, side light, and back light. So front light means that our subject is being lit in the front. That means the light is coming from over our shoulders. So the sun would be behind us. If we're looking at a scene with a tree, for example, the light is coming over our back. It's lighting the front of the trunk of that tree. That would be front lighting. Side lighting is coming from either the right or left. Back lighting means the light is behind the subject. So in that earlier photograph of, of the pier with the sun rising that, that we saw where we had the focusing example, that's an example of backlighting. So when I do the composition part of um, the series here, we'll see a lot more example shots tied together specifically. The other thing besides where the light is coming from is think about the quality of the light. Sunrise and sunset have a very warm orange and red glow to it. Twilight has that kind of purplish, bluish tint to it. Early morning and late afternoon, more yellow, starting to get into the blues. Midday, there's the light temperature, light color is a very bright blue and it often like washes out the colors. Uh, so doesn't mean you can't shoot midday, maybe you're shooting black and white. Uh, depends on the scenes, uh, but often photographers like to use sunrise, sunset, twilight, maybe early morning, late afternoon. Overcast is is when it's cloudy and then it's a very diffuse lighting. Now that light is a little bit towards the cooler side blues. Uh, shadows are also very blue, uh, but overcast is actually a great day to do flower photography because it's a very diffuse uh, light. It's not contrasting, meaning that you have really bright spots and really dark spots. There's not a lot of shadows. So think about where the light is coming from and the quality of the light. How does that affect your composition? Can you use it to enhance and improve your composition? Look at the corners and edges. This is one of the key things that differentiates a beginning photographer for, for a, a more advanced photographer is what is in the, the viewfinder. Are there distracting elements? Can you reframe the picture a little bit, not to change your composition drastically to remove them? Or you can't change your composition. Are they small enough that you could remove those when you're doing your post-image capture processing? So look at the edges for distracting elements. It, it could be twigs or tree, a tree, branch, grass. It could be something, a bright object. Um, so just look around the edge. Run your, once you've got everything in place, run your eyes around the edge and make sure there's no distracting elements. The sky sometimes. 
in a composition can be distracting. If it's a very boring sky, it's all blue or it's all cloudy. It's just a bright uh, element in your, your composition. And then look at your subjects. You want to make so sure your subjects have enough space. They, you don't want to cram them up against a corner or side. You don't want to cut them off unless you intentionally are wanting to cut them off. So you have to determine, is are you committing to cutting it off, and how does that affect your composition, or do you need the whole thing, right? So just look at how the subjects are near the edges. That's a very important thing. And again, as I said, uh, you know, don't, if it's a subject you're not intentionally cutting off for compositional purposes, leave enough space. Just like in the story of the three bears, you know, one porridge was too hot, one was too cold, one was just right. And so we kind of, some of us in photography say, do you have enough porridge? Uh, is there any bright or distracting areas? A very key element in making a great photograph is not having a bright, bright spots because your eye will always be going to the bright spot. Instead of following your composition, sometimes you have a line or a path in your composition that your eye follows and it rests rests on some object within that. Bright areas or very dark areas can often be distracting. And if the sky is in your picture, what does the sky look like? Does it help your composition? Does it not help it? Etc. So again, I cannot overemphasize edges and corners uh, are important. So you can add elements to anchor those corners or you can leave them empty. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, is there too much stuff in your picture? Sometimes a lot of things in your picture are distracting. How can you simplify your composition? That's a very important thing. How can we simplify the composition and make sure that all the things, you know, you don't want anything that distracts. Um, sometimes we can remove a few elements, but try to shoot with an intent and purpose where we, we compose, we get the composition we want. Uh, so the tool of thirds. Uh, this is a, a very old uh, compositional tool, uh, very common, and works very effectively. So t what you do is you divide your picture or your viewfinder frame by thirds horizontally and vertically, and then you frame key subjects where those, those points cross. And there's a lot of variations on using this technique. Uh, and, and again, it's a tool. And they don't have to always perfectly, everything perfectly line up. So here's an example. Here's a leaf floating on a lake. Uh, and it happens to be right near one of the tool of thirds cross points. And that helps to make for a very strong composition. You also notice the pine trees, there's a slight angle going across. You know, that was an intention to get that green contrasting against the blue, against the yellow, the very bright, uh, brownish yellow color of the leaf. Um, and so here's what the photograph looks like without the, the rule of third, tool of thirds. Uh oh, bad. Tool of thirds, right? Composition, tool of thirds. So with it, just to give you an idea of how the framing is and without it. So if you notice in this photograph, it's a great example. Um, I have what's called a lot of negative space. There's not compositional elements in the corners and edges. And that's intentional. You know, I didn't want to uh, distract from the leaf and the idea of this peaceful, serene fall morning. All right, here's a, a composition that I made where um, it's in, I converted a uh, color photograph to black and white. Uh, here in the tool of thirds, I have the horizon at a third. So for most photographs, uh, we don't want to split. So there are no hard and fast rules, remember, but typically we don't want to split the horizon in the middle. There may be occasions to do that, and we'll talk about that in some other composition classes. There may be a situation where I'm doing a shot in water and I want a mirror reflection. So I might split the horizon in the middle of the frame, but it gives you a more dynamic photograph not to do that. So you would have to determine in your photograph, do I want one third sky uh, two-thirds sky, right? How much sky, how much water? And and you don't always have to be exactly. Maybe you want uh, a little under a third of, of, of the water and, and a little more than two-thirds of the sky. So in this composition, again, the tool of thirds I used roughly, you can see I'm not exactly right at the, the horizon, but pretty close um, in this composition. And then I use that rock in the foreground to give another subject element to anchor the photograph. And notice it's not on, on a tool of thirds line, but I think it adds and gives a little more dynamic capability, helps with making it a more of a three-dimensional photograph and a contrasting textural element in the photograph.
And again, you can see I have nothing in the, in the corners uh, or edges that are distracting from the photograph. So th this, I don't have the, 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 the lines uh, on, on, projected on this image, but you can see uh, out in the, I'm out in the prairie taking this photograph with a 70 millimeter lens. I didn't have a macro lens or a long telephoto with me, 70 millimeter, uh, but I was able to shoot it at f2.8. And you can see uh, that I've set the flower off center and that gives it a more dynamic element. And you can also notice the background between the horizon of the grasses and the prairie and the sky. It's, you know, it's not exactly at a third, but it, it's roughly at a third. So that is how I use the tool of thirds in this composition. So it's a very powerful tool. That's the only one we're really gonna talk about um, today, just to get you started. So uh, let's look at one example of a composition just to kind of show you a little bit of the thought process. So I'm, I was at the Chicago Botanic Garden and I'm walking, the, uh, the Botanic Garden is a series of islands and you walk out from the visitor center across a bridge to the first, the, the main island. And out of the corner of my eye, I looked and I saw this great reflection of the sky. I thought, wow, what an awesome photograph. So here's how I lined it up initially. And you can see um, I'm roughly one third of, of the horizon is the sky and two thirds is the water. Um, it wasn't, you know, it was not bad for a first shot, but I, I didn't exactly like the way it came out. I thought, uh, as we'll see, I thought the sky's a little more interesting. The bush on the side isn't too bad. I was limited by how much I could move left or right in the composition because there's um, wires that help to hold the bridge. It's a, sus a small suspension bridge. So I thought, um, interesting composition, but not exactly what I had in mind. So I thought I'll recompose and I want more of the sky with just some of the reflection. I thought this was a more dynamic, interesting composition. So you can see I moved the horizon to about a one third line. Now you can kind of see the, the trees on the left, the weeping willows kind of point, they're angled down pointing across. So there's, you know, kind of a natural path that draws your eye across the island with the other trees. But again, as I told you, I was kind of limited in where how I could move to capture this image. So I still had this kind of distracting element on the side. And I was shooting this as wide as possible with the lens I had, which was 24 millimeter. So I adjusted the length of the lens and moved just a little bit to get rid of that. I think it makes for a stronger photograph to remove the distracting element of, of the tree. I couldn't get uh, enough information in the tree, uh, that tree to the right side to make the composition the way I wanted. So just a simple example of some of the thought process I went through. I decided to put the horizon at about one third. I thought the sky was a little more interesting, but enough of the water and reflections to make it interesting. And the, it gives a little more of a dynamic element to kind of have this natural triangular lines leading into uh, or pointing to the island across the water. So how was it shot? I ended up shooting it at 24 millimeter or 26 millimeters, 100, ISO 100 F. 16, 1 13th of a second, maybe a little too slow. Uh, as I mentioned, if I was going to do it over, I might try different focus points. Um, and I might have a little faster shutter speed. I think 1 13th of a second was a bit slow. If we look, um, I think there's a, it was a not a too breezy of a day, but I think there's a little more movement in those leaves than, than I would like. So uh, the other uh, comment I forgot to mention is this is side lighted. You can see this light is coming across to the right side there and lighting uh, the branches and leaves uh, from my right side as I'm looking at the composition. So that's uh, an example of side lighting. So uh, I might cons consider different focal points uh, to um, maybe try and increase the depth of field, also increasing the shutter speed to get a little bit faster shutter speed. So that's the end. I'm sorry, this is an extra long one. I don't ex um, plan to make any of these uh, traditionally this long. I, my plan is to have all of them shorter. But to get you on the field for the very first time, it's going to have to be a longer presentation. If you have any questions, you need some more illustrations, uh, please don't hesitate to email me at paul at jumpstartnaturephotography.com. And I look forward to uh, sharing the next presentation with you soon. Thank you.